Our scripture this morning is going to come from 2 Peter. We're in the second chapter. We'll be in verse 1 through the first half of verse 10. In the Pew Bible, so if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to read along with me in the Pew Bible. It's found on page 1,207 in the Pew Bible. That's 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And there it's written. But false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. If you would please join me in prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week... Peter introduces us to false teachers and prophets that are existing now during his time. They're beginning to emerge as other apostles are dying off, as Christianity is is moving and, and growing. New leaders are emerging, but there's also among them false teachers and false prophets. It, it, and and when we read Second Peter, we, we can't read in what kind of false teachers make us the most upset, but rather the ones that, that Peter's really talking about here. And, and he's stressing about the false teachers and prophets that emerge and say, you know, all these apostles are dying off, and there's no sign of Jesus' return. So, you know, maybe that's something we can put to the side and say isn't that big of a deal. And, and if Jesus isn't returning, what's all this dark and gloomy talk of a of a final judgment. That, that can't be real either. And so this is the, the falsehoods that are being now preached as apostles are dying off, as Christianity is beginning to bloom there in the world. And, and so the problem, problem is, though, that this false teaching of Jesus not returning, of a, no final judgment, leads to an understanding of there's no such thing as a real hell, that, that God is only love and that ultimately everyone is saved no matter what you believe because God is love, right? right? This is the path you begin moving down. And, and the problem is we're still here in 2023 battling against this theological liberalism within the church, right? It, it's not so much the, the outside pressures and, and, and the straight um, uh ungodly beliefs that are out there, it's the things that look pseudo-Christian, that sound just right enough to lead us down the path of destruction. And in this notion that Jesus isn't returning or even returning anytime soon, that this final judgment, there's so much confusion about it, it's probably not even happening, so let's not worry about it. 
These are the kinds of things that are dangerous to the church and lead us astray without us really knowing unless we're paying close attention. For you see, in 2011, Rob Bell, he was a a mega church pastor at a Christian church up in in Minnesota, and he writes this book, Love Wins. And And it was a seminal work for himself because now he's no longer a Christian pastor and dare I say even a Christian, but he is one of Oprah's favorite spiritual gurus. And and so it's in this book, though, that Bell contends how God is love, so therefore hell is a is a something we create for ourselves. That there's no real physical place of hell. It's not this place that's gonna end in 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 a lake of fire as maybe the Bible describes, but something we've created for ourselves. And God doesn't punish for eternity because in the end, love wins. And you know, folks, in in my heart of hearts, I'm going to be real honest with you here. I want that to be true. I want that so badly to be true that, that no matter where you are in life, all throughout history and time, I want God's love to be so overwhelming that he just wraps everybody up and saves everybody. I want that so badly. And in in theological terms, it's called universalism. You can believe whatever you want, but Because God's grace and God's love is so big. Because God is love, he's just going to wrap everybody up and save them unto himself. But when we read scripture, it doesn't say that. So now we have to do some reconciling, right? In our heart of hearts, we can have this, this desire and this want for something to be true. But when the Bible speaks to it and we begin butting our heads with it, which is more fallible? Are, are, our feelings and our ideals for what we hope is true or, or God's word. And, and so we as Christians are called to, to humble ourselves before God's word as the truth and the authority. And, and, and so this is kind of what's facing us. There, there's a problem with universalism that, that love wins, that God is love. And, and it comes and begins having a misunderstanding. One is that it mischaracterizes God. We only get partial view of of who God is if we assume that God is just love. We lose an entire picture of God. It it isn't what the Bible says. Jesus is clear. He says, no one will come to the Father except through me. And so it begins getting really hard to reconcile the whole world unto God when there's so many willing to deny Jesus. And then, I mean, even if you can get past those first two, you've got this third problem to contend with. And it makes it in that if love wins in the end and God saves everyone to himself, it makes the cross of Christ unnecessary. And then you've got to go, well, then what did Jesus die for? And this is what Peter is facing as he writes this letter. So he's writing this letter to point people back to the truth. Because it's not too many steps past. It's not this big, dangerous, slippery slope that we've all been warned of. And and we go, it's not that slippery. Take one step on it. Find out how slippery it is for yourself. It it will lead you straight to a wide path of destruction. I can speak from personal experience. So Peter writes this letter to point us back to the truth. Because yes, God is love. The Apostle John writes that. First John chapter 4, verse 8, he says, God is love. That is a picture of who God is. That is very much part of his character. But also, God is holy. Psalm 99, that was our call to worship in verse 9. David writes, for the Lord our God is holy. Peter himself in his first letter, he quotes Leviticus when he says, You therefore shall be holy, for I am am holy because the full character of God is God is holy and God is love God is love by himself leads us to universalism and God is holy by himself leads us to legalism and both are false see it's because of his love that God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins it's because he is holy that God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. Both are true with Jesus. But we have a tendency here. We have a tendency to just focus on his love. That God loves you, you know, 
God's going to love you. God's got you. God, God is love. We want to focus on it. And one, because it makes us feel better, right? It makes us feel better about ourselves. God is love, so I must be doing okay. He loves me, right? But also there's a, there's a second aspect of it that we really don't talk about because if we just treat God as love and assume that every, God's going to save everyone unto himself, then it gets us off the hook from any evangelistic requirements, doesn't it? Right? Because all of a sudden, if God's going to save everyone, what do I need to tell anyone about Jesus for? Right? Now I don't have to worry about that with my family, with my friends, with my neighbors. This responsibility of being an ambassador for Christ or the light to the world through Jesus Christ is now taken off my plate because God is love. Right? He's going to love everyone. But it also, it, it makes us feel better too. Right? So we lose the evangelistic responsibility, but it makes us feel better because we use it as permission. We use it as permission to sin. I can sin, God still loves me. We use it as permission to keep sinning. I, I, can, I don't have to give this up today, God still loves me. And eventually, it leads us to call sin good and even holy. And suddenly, we have turned God from being the holy, righteous creator of the universe into a loving, passive affirmer of our sin. Because if God doesn't love everything about ourselves, right? If God doesn't love the whole me, like, then we're only left with two options. Right? If God doesn't love everything about us, in, 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 then we're left with two options. One, we can change ourselves to meet God's standards. Therefore, be holy for the Lord your God is holy. Right? That's the call Peter makes to us. It's the call Paul makes to us. It's the call of Scripture. Or we can go the other direction that the false teachers and prophets of Peter's day and even today would lead us down. And that is to change God to meet our standards. And folks, I'll going to tell you this, that God is nothing more than a golden calf worthy of being tossed into the wilderness. And this is what Peter fights and contends with in the first century. And the church still contends with it here in 2023. So, so as Peter writes this letter, he paints these three beautiful pictures with his words. Because he's contending with the God is love only. Like Jesus isn't returning. There is no final judgment. You can sin. You can keep sinning. Like even some of your sin is good. He's contending with that. So he paints these pictures for us to demonstrate God's holiness and, and God's judgment that, that does exist within him. And the first one he paints for us is of angels. A beautiful picture of angels. Fallen angels, though. The fallen angels from Genesis 6, the, the, the sons of God that began consorting with, with humans and licentiousness and everything else. And so they are fallen angels. And Peter says that they have been cast to hell and held in chains in the dark, awaiting the judgment. Peter's point in this painting is for us to not forget even angels. We're not spared from God's judgment. Even angels who were in the life, in the presence of God, and knew what that was like, weren't spared from his judgment. Then he paints this picture of the flood. And if you know a little bit about Christianity, you've heard the story of Noah and the ark and the flood of the whole world. And he paints this picture of a flooded earth with Noah and his seven family members on the ark there for us. Noah, the, the righteous man and his family, saved because of his faithfulness. A picture painted to remind us not to slide back in to the deep pool, drowning in the lie that God never punishes sin. Because he does. And then in the final painting, we're left with Lot in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, left to extinction, burning behind him. 
And there we have Lot, who's visited, who has two visitors to his house. And he opens the door and it's angels and, and he lets them in and, and protects them. And they're coming to tell him of the coming judgment upon the cities. Because there is a reason Lot felt the need to protect these angels. Because the lawlessness and the sinfulness was so bad within these cities, if he had not protected them, he was not sure what would happen to them. And so there's a reminder there for those of us who live in the city today that when we indulge in the appetites of this world and when we begin to think that there are no consequences for our private behavior, that God's love, that God is love and only love, that nothing bad will ever happen to us, then we have put ourselves in grave danger of self-deception and in line with God's wrath. Peter paints these pictures to remind us God is holy and God is love and there is a time where Jesus will return and there is a final judgment to come where Jesus will judge the living and the dead. And so we, dear Christians, we're left to not relax God to our standards, but because of his grace and his mercy, we are called to live into his standards of holiness. See, Peter writes after these, these pictures of God's judgment, he says, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. He reminds us that, that while there is a judgment that exists, that while God is holy and God hates sin, that, that the, the word the Bible actually uses, God abhors sin, which is like two degrees past hate. He abhors sin, that while God hates sin, that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, that it is the Lord who does the rescuing, that Jesus not only will come again as the righteous judge, but Jesus first came to save us. See, it's written in John 3, 16. And there, the apostle John writes that Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Folks, it, it would be really nice if we could just say God is love and everything be okay from there on out. But that's not the truth of Scripture. He wouldn't be just, he wouldn't be holy, he wouldn't be God anymore. Because he would stop being who he's been from the beginning. And God is the same today as he was yesterday and how he will be tomorrow. For it's by his grace that we are saved. Saved into a more abundant and enriched life now and into a life eternal in the presence of our Father that we will join for all of eternity, but we aren't saved by grace so that we can have permission to keep on sinning or to rename sins as good, but rather saved to live as beacons of light for his grace and his mercy and his righteousness and his holiness and his glory in this fallen world. We are called to curb our earthly appetites, to back away from the bounty of this world's table and all of its sinfulness it has to offer us. Because after all, after all, dear friends, a better feast awaits us still. Amen? Amen. Amen.